This morning I'm going to talk about the Word of God. I'm going to talk about the power of the Word. We know the Word of God. We read Bible and we teach Bible and we preach from the Word of God. But many times we fail to experience it as the power of God. Amen. So that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. You see, God had given the Ten Commandments to Israel. He gave his commandments to Israelites to keep and obey, and then they will leave. However, they were not able to render their obedience. You see, we, unless we are born again, are not able to keep God's commandments. It is impossibility. The fallen nature, our flesh, do not have any power to obey God's words and God's commandments. And we know that. So God had given the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel through Moses first so that people can understand that uh, this is so holy law of God and it's good. If we obey it, we will leave. If we disobey it, we'll be destroyed and be lost. And they understand that. They felt it, and yet they are not, they understand, they begin to understand, they are not able to obey them. God made them to realize that first, because the purpose of the law is not to save, but the purpose of the law is to condemn, to kill, to help us to realize that we are sinners. We are utterly unable to bring about the righteousness for our own selves. That is the purpose of the law. When we have a weight scale, when we put ourselves on the weight scale, especially ladies, when you see oh, 160 pounds, then you're about to be fainted, right? Okay, this can be, so you don't believe it, what do you do? You throw the scares away. Does it solve the problem? No, it does not. You see, that is the price, price, uh, precisely the purpose of the scale, to let you know you are overweight. That's what it is. So law, the purpose of the law of God, the function of it, of it is to expose us and tell us you're a sinner. There's nothing you can do about that. You see? And then the law becomes the teacher. You see? And it is going to lead us to Jesus Christ, the source of our salvation. So after God has given us the law, he gave the Israelites the sanctuary service. Now, sanctuary service illustrates the work of God. How does God melt our sin problem from our system? How does God work to melt the problem of sin from our hearts? That's what it is. So through the sanctuary illustrations, God has instructed his people all this time. So if we go into from the courtyard, if we step into the first compartment, which is the holy place, what do we see? On the left-hand side, golden stamp. On the right-hand side, what do we see? We see the table of showbread. And then what do we see in the middle? We see the altar of incense. You know, interestingly, actually the golden stand, the candlesticks represent the Word of God. You see, Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is what? Light on my path. Right? Lamp unto our path and light unto our feet. Right? So, the word of God 
is the light. The Word of God is the only source. When you step into the first compartment, which is the sanctuary, you don't see any openings, no sunroof, no windows. The only light source is from the candlesticks, which, which represents the Word of God. And then on the right hand side, we see the table of showbread. Showbread represents the Word of God as well. As we travel to heavenly Canaan, we need the light to shine our path so, so that we can realize about pitfalls and then, and then holes and the dangers ahead of us. So it guides us. It's our light. That's only our light source. What is the righteousness? What is the unrighteousness? What is the truth and what is the error? So we will receive the spirit of the discernment. And then on the right-hand side, we must eat as we travel. Even though we have a light to shine our path, we must be nourished. Otherwise, we cannot move on. We cannot stay on the course. So the Word of God is our sustenance. It gives us power to stay alive. You see, the showbread represents the Word of God. And in the middle, the altar of incense represents the mediation of Jesus Christ. Actually, it is grace. As we travel, sometimes we, we fall, make mistakes, you see, and uh, we receive and we face problems. And then God gives us grace. Grace is His mediatorial work. It's not only forgiveness, but also giving enough power so that we can overcome the things of our lives. Now, so in the holy place, we all we see is the word of God. After we confess our sins and forgiven, and then we are born again, we are regenerated, and then all we need in our Christian living is the word of God. It is that important. The word of God is the same. There's no new light under the sun. It's the same thing. That's why some people try to try to find something very peculiar and different and fall into the fanaticism and then extremism. You see, some people, they are trying to emphasize unimportant things as the most important things. That's extremism. That's fanaticism simply. The Word of God is very simple. You see? But some people are bored because they, they read and hear about the same word day and night and from week to week, from month to month. So they're trying to, trying to invent new things. We don't have to. You see? Okay, now, if you are sick of eating food, will you start to eat tree or rock? You cannot do that. Food is the same food. You see, you can never become bored eating food. If you become boring in eating food, you'll, you'll die or you'll be in trouble. Many people have problem eating the simple manna coming down from heaven every day. You see, manna is from heaven. The Word of God is like manna. We cannot cultivate, we cannot farm, we cannot get it from, from, the, from the land. It has to come down from heaven freshly every day. You know, in the sanctuary service, you know, they have to bake the bread once every week. That represents God's fresh manna for God's people. You, know, you must receive the fresh manna from God every day. You need to understand how to be maintained by the Word of God. Not just hearing, not just reading, but assimilating the thoughts of God into our hearts and lives so that our thoughts are being changed, our philosophies are changed. And we get a spiritual strength from it. You know, and how to distinguish things, how to um, differentiate things. Now, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Now, how do we live by the word of God? That's what I'm talking about this morning. It's very simple. It's not new. Very, it may sound, even from the beginning, it may sound very boring, living by the word. Well, I have heard that before. You know, it's a very simple truth. But are we living it? That's an issue, isn't it? Okay? We live by every word presideth out of the mouth of God. What does it mean? Now, John chapter 6, verse 6, 3 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. <clears throat> All right, which means unless, no, the spirit is alive. That's what it means. Unless we are living in the spirit, our living in the flesh, profit nothing. It's just nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see, the Bible says, walk in the spirit, which means walking is a series of steps. One, two, three, four. You're walking one by one. Every juncture of life, we live by the word of God. You see, so we walk in the spirit. What is the spirit? The word Jesus spoke to us. It's the spirit, Jesus said, in the Bible. So the word of God, the Bible, is the spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? We receive His truth and we receive His words. Nowadays, I meet many, many Christians, many, many genuine Christians, converted Christians from many different denominations. You name them. As a matter of fact, right now, I'm having meetings with the, with, the, with the Christians coming from various denominations. Amen. I did that for two nights. Tonight, after the meetings from this church, I'm going to go down and have a meeting again with them. These people are good Christians. You know, they tell me their former experiences. Some people, they receive the Holy Spirit by supernatural power. You know, I mean, he didn't, and someone told me that he didn't know Jesus Christ, but he followed his wife to a certain praying house. And all of a sudden, he didn't know Christ, but he was sitting in the last pew of that, uh, of that kind of chapel. And some kind of ball of fire came down from heaven, hit him on the chest, he knocked down on the floor. And then he uh, you know, regained his strength and stood up and received the Holy Spirit. And then one lady told me that uh, she got struck down by the, some kind of light on her back and it felt heat all over her body. He, she was just uh, you know, rolling on the floor. After a few minutes, she stood up and she received the Holy Spirit. All kinds of crazy stories and ideas. You see, Satan is trying to, trying to devise certain uh, you know, uh, experiences to confuse God's people, to deviate God's people from the real source of receiving the Holy Spirit. Amen. How do we receive Holy Spirit? As we receive the Word of God spoken by Jesus Christ. Amen. As we receive and understand the truth written in the Bible, that's how we receive the Holy Spirit. Truth will quicken us. The truth will fill us. That when we receive the truth, when we receive the word of God, our ideas are changed. Ah, oh, I have been thinking differently. Yes, Lord, I will change it. Our philosophies, our value systems are being changed. Not only that, our hearts are transformed accordingly. So the spirit, the truth will change us, our thoughts, our patterns, our lives. Not only that, it will change our hearts in core so that our motivations and our desires are going to be changed. 
our direction of our life is going to be changed. And all of a sudden, we begin to have the urge to live for God. We are urged to preach, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. If we receive the word of God in pure value, it's a power. It's a living word. It comes in. It's the spirit of God. It knocks us down, changes us, transforms us, and gives us like electrical power. Only we can understand in our own experiences to be revived, rejuvenated from despair to hope, from distrust to trust, from defeat to victory and overcome. Our Christian living becomes living one because the Word of God is alive. Do you believe it? Do you believe the Word of God is living Word? If it does, let it live in your heart today. You see? Now, John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh. Jesus Christ was the Word, and is the Word, will be the Word of God. Jesus Christ is acting living Word, the way He lived, the way He spoke, the way He behaved. Everything's are about God's revelation. So Jesus Christ is living Word. Jesus Christ lived in this world as a living Word, was made flesh for 33 and a half years. And they saw Jesus Christ, and they saw God the Father and His glory. Likewise, the Word of God should become incarnated within us. The Word become flesh. If we receive and eat of the Word of God, that living Word comes into our conscience and heart. It becomes alive. We live Jesus' life. What is it? The Word becomes our flesh. So incarnation of Jesus Christ, it should be your experience and mine as well. It's not only Jesus Christ's experience. It should be our experience if we receive the Word of God. Okay, the desire of ages, page 123. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. Ah, ah. If we are united by faith with him, sin does not become power over us anymore. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it, to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may attain to perfection of character. Do you believe in character perfection? Oh, yes, oh, yes I do. This is the promise of God. All right, now, and how this is accomplished? Christ has shown us. By what means did he overcome in the conflict with Satan? By the word of God. How do we overcome? By the word of God. That's how Jesus Christ overcame. He is, the, he is our only true example, is he not? Yes. So Jesus Christ showed the example how he overcame the temptations of Satan. Ah. Only by the word could he resist temptation. It is written, he said, when assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or the weakness of self, but to the power of the word. All its strength is yours. All oh, the promises of God is ours. You see, when we are assailed by temptation, Look not to circumstance. Oh, look at this. I'm all alone. Look at this. I'm powerless. Look at this. I'm so poor. I don't have any, anything. I'm despised. I'm segregated. You see? But uh, actually, when we are assailed by temptations, look not to circumstances or to the weakness of self, but behold the power of the Word of God but to the power of the Word of God. Okay? When you're tempted, you feel sad. What do you do? You feel sad. We feel sad. Sometimes we feel sorrowful. What do you do then? Do not trust your feelings of flesh. That's not real you. That's what I, what I, what I mean. When you feel sad, 
Deny it. Resist it. That's not you. Hold upon your spirit, the word of God. When you feel down, trust the word of God. Look to the power of the word, not look to the weakness of yourself. Sounds like positive thinking theory. I'm not talking about positive thinking theory. I'm talking about power of the word of God here. When you are discouraged, what do you do? We are discouraged? We are discouraged. You can do nothing about that. You feel discouraged. You see? But do not look to that. Yes, we are discouraged. I feel down. No doubt about that. I'm stressed out. I'm, I'm dis in despair. But I know we, we all understand that. That's our flesh. But look to our spiritual experience. In spite of my sadness, in spite of my despair, in spite of my circumstances, Lord, I trust the power of thy word today. Amen. That's how you choose. Amen. You know, positive thinking theory is talking about find the strength and power within yourself. That's what they say. Find God within yourself. But we are not talking about that. We are talking about find God and find strength and power from above. It's different. We deny ourselves. Yes, when you lost your spouse, when you lost your parents, when you lost your beloved son or daughter, oh yes, you are sorrowful, you are sad. Unexp unexplainably. I understand that. We were sad. You know, my mother is nursing home bed. She's almost unconscious. Sometimes she recognizes me, but most of the case she doesn't. It brings tremendous sorrow to my heart. You see, I and my mother are very close since my boyhood. And I, I, I've been telling you about the story of my mother time to time. You see, but she cannot really recognize me that much anymore. I don't know when she's going to go away. It brings, brings me such a sadness. But even though I'm in sadness, I have to deny it. I live by the word of God. I'm not wrapped up, controlled by my own circumstances, but look to the word of God. That's how we live by the word. It's our choice. It's our choice. Okay, John 6, 6, 3, uh, 6, 6, uh, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay, Review and Herald, November 23, 1897. We find something interesting here. As the blood is formed in the body by the food eaten, so Christ is formed within by the eating of the word of God, which is his flesh and blood. Oh, now, actually, when, I, when I'm looking at your face, do you know who you are? Oh, I can see it. Carrots, spinaches, soybeans. Ah, oh, let me see. Tofu. You know, I can see you. All those oh, 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 fruits. I can see some peaches in you, some grapes, watermelons. Those food went into your system, digested, and become you. Became the ingredients of, of your cells and then formed your body. And it made your blood, right? Eating of food. Same thing. Spiritually, when we eat and read and study and meditate upon the Word of God, it becomes what? Me, ourselves. It forms my ideas. It forms my faith. It forms my philosophy. It forms my ideals. It forms my faith. It forms my strength and everything. The Word of God incarnated and becomes me. That's how to live by the word of God. Now, look at this. He who feeds upon that word has Christ formed within the hope of glory. 
You know, sometimes we, 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 we pray that, Lord Jesus Christ, please come into my heart and then please live and dwell within me. That's right. But it's only symbolic words. Okay? It's a symbolic words. But actually, practically, what does it mean? We receive, study, read, and meditate upon the Word of God. We accept the Word of God. That's why we will accept Jesus Christ, simply. And then those words come into our heart and form Christ within us. What does it mean? When we receive and believe the Word of God, we begin to think like Jesus Christ. If we receive and then believe the Word of God, we become meek like Jesus Christ. If we receive the Word of God and believe, it becomes as humble as Jesus Christ, which means we, those words are accepted into our hearts as food, and those foods com compose our body, spiritual body, in a way that it, we become like Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not difficult, practically. It's not difficult at all. <clears throat> The written word introduces to the searcher the flesh and the blood of the Son of God, and through what? Obedience to that word. Ah, this is very important, isn't it? Through the obedience to that word, he becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Without the obedience to the word of God, we do not participate in nature, divine nature my friends. Let me ask this question. Very serious question. Is there anything in your life you disobey the Word of God? I don't know what it is. I don't, you, I don't know your personal lives. But is there anything? I'm asking you, young people, old and everyone in this church this morning, is there anything in your life today, right now, that you disobey the Word of God, even though you know it? Surrender it. Surrender it. Break on the rock of Jesus Christ. Right now. What is holding you? And you know that is wrong. And you know that is your idol. And you know that is the stumbling block of your spiritual life, and you're still holding on to it. Why? Do you know why many, many Christians do not want to follow Jesus Christ all the way? Because they come to Jesus Christ only up until to the limit that they feel comfortable. If they, if the Word of God requires of us to sacrifice, to surrender something, Sometimes we stop, stop, and being unchristian. Now it says, through obedience to that word, he becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Do you know why so many Christians are so powerless in their Christian living nowadays? Do you know why? Some, sometimes when, when, when they are sitting in the church few, you know, I, I'm an evangelist. I go many different, different places, many different countries to preach the gospel, to teach, to give seminars. You know? And uh, I've been doing that, let me see, so far about 33 years. No wonder why I became so white in my hair. 33 years is a long time. I've seen it many, many different places. People are here in the church. People are in the pews of different churches and different meetings and seminars. But when I'm looking at them, their eyes are dead fish. They're dead. There's no sparkle in their eyes. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I'm not only talking about you feel tired and then become drowsy. Oh, I want to hear the word of God, but my, my flesh is weak. Oh, I'm trying to open my eyes and just keep, keep on closing. I'm not to only talking about your flesh, your, your bodily fatigue. I'm talking about spiritual deadness. Why is it 
because people, when they stop obeying the word of God, they're dead. You know, this is very simple things, but when I discuss these things before the congregation, sometimes these words make some people very uncomfortable. Now, Laodicean church condition, what is it? Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. And he says, Thou, that thou art neither cold nor hot. You know what? <clears throat> and I'm talking to lukewarm. Those who are lukewarm are not hot nor cold. Lukewarm. Dangerous people. Now, if you would like to stay in lukewarmness, if you do not trust and follow Jesus Christ all the way, then I would like to advise you this morning. Quit believing. Quit coming to the church. Go to the world. Enjoy and, uh, the fun of the sin. Why are you in the church? First of all, isn't that silly? Why are you wasting your time? If you are not fully surrendered to Christ, why are you living as Christians? Why do you name yourselves Christians? That's ridiculous. Wasting your time, wasting your offering money, wasting everything. Isn't that true? Might as well you want to go out and have fun. Go to the, uh, uh, you know, certain park, amusement park. Enjoy yourself. And ride some, what do you call it? American Eagles? Go ride. It'll be better for you. This is stressful when you hear, hear my stress testimony like this. It'll be stressful to you. If you want to become a Christian, become a Christian. If you want to believe Jesus, believe Jesus. If you want to surrender, surrender it. What stops you? Many, many Christians they bargain. They're, try, they're trying to trade with heaven with small, itchy bitchy, small worldly things. It's pitiful. Pitiful. Now, if you're lukewarm, if you think you are, then probably you, it would be better for you to quit believing, quit coming to the church, because when you are dragging your feet like this, and the last final conflict comes, and then you finally, then you betray the faith in Jesus Christ, and many other weeds are going to be uh, very tempted and then trembling too because of your uh, you know, betraying later on. That's why sometimes if you read John chapter 6, Jesus Christ said, if you do not drink my blood in my flesh, you have no relationship with me. Oh, this is very difficult. What is he talking about? And many, many of them left Jesus Christ and no longer walked with him. And Jesus said, you are, are here with me because you are fed with the fleshy food. But I'm talking about spiritual experience. If you don't have that, if you are not willing to have that, go away from me. Go away. And many of them, they went out. And Jesus felt very sad. He turned around and asked to his disciples, do you want to go or so? And Apostle Peter was very disappointed. Oh, oh, Jesus, we can have, you know, big church, huge church. This is the success of your ministry. We can build a mega church here in this Galilee but he just chased thousands of people away. Why do you do that, Lord? But Jesus said, do you want to go also? And Peter said, no. We're, since there's a word of eternal life is with you, whence will we go? Where will we go? Even though in his disappointment, he spoke the truth. Spoke the truth. And uh, Revelation 3, 17. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, without the true experience of the word of God, we are blind. We do not really understand our spiritual, spiritual condition. Okay. 
Steps to Christ, page 81. This is very important phrase as far as I am concerned. Many years ago, I was pastor, ordained minister, evangelist, but I felt that uh, my Christian living is shot. I'm not a good Christian. Holy Spirit spoke to me one morning, David, you're not a pastor. Not only that, you're not even a Christian. If you walk, and in the near future, you'll feel you'll just drop. If you drop, then you'll find that's, the, that's where the, the burning of hell. Hot place, you'll find that'll be your hell. It's a very, very terrible feeling. And I felt and I knew that something is wrong with me. I preached good sermons, but I began to realize that something is really wrong with me. What is it? I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was living double lives. You know, I played angel in the church, saint. But I act like devil at home. Do you know what I'm talking about? And then um, I didn't have any peace and joy of salvation and joy of forgiveness in my heart. I gave good sermons, nice preachings, but I pretended a lot. Sometimes I felt cold sweats are coming down on my back while I was preaching because my conscience still bothering me. You know, I'm preaching good sermons, and yet I do not leave the way I preach right now. That's a terrible feeling as a pastor. Anyway, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I, I, you know, I, I didn't know the true gospel and the gospel power and everything. The gospel is the power of God unto those who believe. I knew in knowledge, but I didn't know what it means to my personal lives, personal life. Well, anyway... One day, it was the time, it was the day that I had to prepare my dissertation. In my theology dissertation. Oh, I, mean, I was pastoring a church. At the same time, I tried to advance in my degrees in theology. I was preparing a thesis. I was in the library. I was supposed to write and, and then get all these books, 1,000 pages book, 1,500 pages books, 900 pages books, and all the theological, uh, you know, the books and, and all that. And with the theological jargonings, sometimes I don't, in, under, I don't understand what they're talking about, but still I have to write it, you know, and all that. And uh, on that day, I didn't want to, somehow I didn't want to read them, read them anymore. And I just brushed them aside. And I began to read books. I want to find the truth, the word of God, for my own soul, to heal my own problem. So I opened a small book called Steps to Christ, and I opened the page 81, and one sentence phrase just magnified, came up so vividly, so hardly, like a sword with a two-edged Two-edged sword just came at, came at me, boom, and hit me. And it was this. They are not required to weary themselves with anxiety about success. And you may say, oh, come on, Brother Kong, what are you talking about? So, so what? what? What does it mean? That was my root of my sin. That was my problem. I know sin is sin, but there are many different roots and branches, you see. So, my problem was this. I'm a minister and evangelist, so I want to be successful. I want to be recognized. I want to make my church grow big, grow tithe and offerings in amount. I want my 
conference recognize me. I want my churches recognize me. Someday I am going to be on top of the leadership. I was caring about my success as a pastor so much. I was, in a way, sometimes stressed out. Think about success. Do you think the businessmen are so eager for their success? Pastors? Oh, I tell you, my friends, the success becomes their idol. Human success. Growing of the church. Membership, numbers, success. Fame, recognition, popularity. Success kills you. If you understand what I'm talking about. And uh, true Christians, they are not required to weary themselves with anxiety about success. When I read that, the Word of God, the simple Word of God, wow! It was a dynamite. It came and hit me. And I'm just broken into pieces. Yes, Lord, that's it. That's the, my problem. That's the source. That's the root of my problem. And somehow I began to see the light from heaven. You know, there's a big hole. There's a big hole in my soul at that time I felt. And wait a minute, that's the problem. That's the problem. You know, I, I thought I was working for God and His honor and glory. But you know what? I was working for my own self and my, for my own honor and for my own glory. I began to realize that, oh, Lord, that's it. That's my problem. That's why I'm so stressed out with the success. On that day, honestly, I all, all of a sudden I began to feel that there's no one in that library. There are many, the library was almost packed, but I felt like I was the only person in the library sitting. And I began to feel the light was shining from heaven to my chest, to my heart, somehow. That's how I felt. And I stood up. And I felt like, you know, I began to pray of my confession of sins, the roots of my problems. And then all of a sudden I felt the heavy burden on my shoulders roll down. And I became freed. I began to feel that, oh, I'm so freed. I'm so light. And I feel peace in my soul. And I walked out from the library and opened the door. And it came out, and somehow, by God's providence, I don't know, that's how I felt. I saw the flock of birds were flying in the, mid, in the midst of sky. And I felt, that, oh, look at those birds, how peaceful, how peaceful they are. They're born as birds. They live as birds. They're living according to the purpose of their creation of God. So what, what do they do? They, in the morning, they wake up, they eat their food, and then praise God's name all day long. All day long, they sing. And then they go to bed at night. In the morning, they wake up and eat the food provided by God, and they sing all day long. And they go to bed. And I thought that, oh, wait a minute, the birds are living according to the purpose of creation, but I have been living my life for me, for myself. No wonder why I was so stressed out. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I'm a creature. But I haven't lived for thy honor. I have lived my life for my own self. I have wasted time, money, energy, my talents to glorify myself, not thee. Lord, I repent and I surrender. That day the Lord created new heart in me. The word of God, simple word of God, strike, struck the core of my sin problem. We should live by the word of God every day. As we expose ourselves to the Word of God, it becomes light and revelation from God. It shines our hearts, our consciences, and helps us to understand and know. You know, after that experience, I began to preach the gospel as it is according to the Bible. 
oh boy, I thought the people, many, many people would stand up with me and then say, well, brother, you're right. I'm going to, I'm going to you know, stand beside you and preach the same things. But it is contrary. I began to get all kinds of accusations and criticisms and all oppositions. And, and I thought, what is happening with me? I mean, am, am I all of a sudden become, uh, became a fanatic? Or, or like, a, am I preaching a heresy? Or so what is this? And then, and then I began to start a ministry. Preach the real everlasting gospel to God's people. And I begin to, and then the Lord led us to start a light for life ministry. Now we are preaching true gospel, true messages, true doctrines and teachings of the Bible and prophecies to various Christians and various different denominations. God has opened the doors. When, when Satan and man and organizations close the doors, always God opens windows. And he opens the windows and possibilities. And the Lord helped, helped me to travel many different parts of the world. You see, recently I came back from Korea trip. You know what? In one city in the middle of South Korea, and, I had a, and we had a pastoral seminar. And 110 pastors from many different denominations, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, you name it, Pure Gospel Church, these pastors came. 110 of them, and listened to my lectures. And I could see tears in their eyes. They're agreeing with the truth and the biblical everlasting gospels. And one pastor came up to me and said, you know what? I'm going to declare my church as independent church from my denominations. And, uh, and, and as a requirement, I have, to, I have to write my protest in our church newspaper. These are the reasons why I have to make myself and my church as independent from this denomination because this denomination doesn't preach truly 100% biblical ways. And he said, I'm going to do that next week. Another pastor came up to me. This, is, this pastor is, is Presbyterian pastor. And he came up to me and said, Pastor Khan, you know what? I've been listening to you on your website for the last two years. I'm convicted with the truth of God, of the Bible. And he said, you know what, brother? Before I came to this meeting, I called our board meetings of our church and asked one of them, every each one of them, and said, please sign this document saying that after I come back from this, this seminar, I'm going to make this church independent church. And I'm going to start to preach as it is in the Bible. If there's anyone who refuse and uh, uh, reject, you may go out. It's your choice. Please sign the document. And he said, 99% of the board signed that document. And he said, we begin to preach the true biblical message, true word of God, living by the word of God, that experience, the gospel experience, to the people who are living in Asia, Orient. God is working mightily simply because the Lord had mercy on this poor soul and then began to experience what it means to live by the word of God. Amen. And the Lord began to work miracles after miracles through our ministry. Ah. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes solve, that thou mayest see. Okay, anoint with, with the eyes solve, that is the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? By the reading and contemplate the word of God. That's how we are able to see things correctly. The word of God. Now, what is the righteousness? The word of God teaches us this way. You know, simply, people do not take the word of God as they are. That's why they're blinded. 
why God's people are blinded with the brightest truth in the world in the earth history. Why they are so blinded, Laodicean church. The reason is because they don't take the word of God as they are. Christ Object Lessons, page 312 says, By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, the will is merged in his will, the mind becomes one with his mind, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him, we live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Amen. Isn't that simple? When we surrender, God's thoughts become our thoughts. His mind becomes ours. His spirit becomes our spirit. Why? Because we received his word. We received his thoughts. We received his character. We, we received his plan. We received his, his prophecies. We received his ideas. No wonder why our hearts combined with Christ and become one. Why? Because his philosophy becomes ours. Because we read and assimilate, we accept his word. No wonder why. It's not simple. That's righteousness. Righteousness means righteous. God is only righteous. When we accept Jesus Christ, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. Not only imputed, but imparted, giving to us by experience every day, imparted righteousness. Hmm. What's so difficult about? The truth is to be planted in the heart. Ah, planted in the heart, the seed of God. It is to control the mind and regulate the affections. Oh, the word of God can regulate our feelings and emotions and affections. Oh, yes, certainly. Isn't that what the word of God says? When we, are, when we feel down, so what? Let's suppose you, are, you have cancer on third stage, and doctor will, doctors are, are telling, telling you that you have only three months to live. So what? You die. Right? Die, so what? Don't you worry about that. When I say this to patients, and they say, you're so cold, Pastor Kong. You know, I'm, I'm suffering. I'm dying. I'm, I'm going to be separated from my family. You just say, die. Isn't that too cruel? <laughs> Even though you are healed, you're going to die again anyway. Dying is dying. Death can never give us any, any fear. The true love chased away the fear. Perfect love, chest away, cast away the fear, darkness away from our hearts. So when I see the patients who are in sick with leukemia, cancer, all kind of pro problems, you see, I tell them, die. You may die. When you think that, <coughs> all of a sudden they feel, oh, uh oh, yes, that's right. I mean, the worst thing can happen to me is death, right? And then if you accept the death, and everything's are fine now. Okay, I'll die. Lord, I'll die. That's okay. You don't have to heal me. If you heal me, I, I'm, I'll be thankful. But even though you don't, you don't heal, heal me, I'm fine. I'll see you someday. So you are, you're fine now. Oh, okay. I'm not down anymore. I'm not depressed anymore with this problem, with my circumstances. I trust the word of God, and I, and I trust the promise of resurrection, and I trust the word of God, of hope, of new Jerusalem, eternity, all these things, the inheritance of the saints. This whole universe is going to be mine. So you're hopeful, thankful, Lord. Yes, I die, so what? I have Jesus. You know what? If you begin to feel that way, you are healed. And, then, you know, and many times the cancer is going to go out from you, from your body, because your soul is healed. Your thoughts are healed. That's true healing. And I, with some other friends, I, once I anointed someone together, she had, had a breast, breast cancer. But you know, you know what? After that prayer anointing, her cancer was not gone. 
Still, she had a breast, breast cancer, but something definitely has been changed to her. She became so positive. She became so happy, glad. So she woke up from the hospital bed, and she was going around and knocking on every hospital bed at a door and began to witness for Jesus Christ. He was so happy. You know what? I'm going to die in six months, you know what? But I'm happy. What kind of person is this? Yes, I'm going to die. And the doctor told me this morning, I'm going to die within six months. But that's fine with me. I'm going to die anyway. But I have hope. His sin-sick soul was healed. It's not a true healing. Oh, my brothers and sisters this morning in this church, are you sick? I'm not talking about your bodily sickness. Oh, yes, that too. But in your soul, are you sick? Are you in disappointment and stressed out and despair? Are you in darkness? Come on, friends. Is God dead? No. Let me ask you again. Is God dead? No. God is alive. Then we have hope, don't we? Yeah. This is not talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about hope in Jesus Christ. That's how the word of God, we eat and live accordingly. That's what it is. I hate to see Christians you know, be like this, you know, walk like this, sit like this, you know, in the church, long faces. You know, when, when I see, see that kind of person's face, I feel, you know, down. I feel discouraged even by looking at her or looking at him. Come on, friends. The, the Word of God can control our affection. Affections, feelings, emotions. That's right. Joy in the Lord. It's, it's not a drug. It's a real thing coming to, from the cre Creator. All right. Break thou the bread of life. You know this, this hymn very well. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Praise God. Hallelujah. Right? We, when we read the word of God, we seek, we pants for thee, Lord. We want thee in my heart. We want thee in our hearts, Lord. That's the only thing that I need. How much do you need Jesus Christ? How much do you need him? With all your heart, with all your might, all your life, then you will find Jesus. Ah, the desire of ages, ages, page 390. You know, recently one pastor, and uh, he, he said, I began to listen to your sermons and, uh, and then uh, in the DVDs or CDs or, or internets, and he listened and listened, and uh, sometimes I quote quotations from the Christ after lessons, great controversy, and desire of ages. So this person said, what kind of book they are. I've never heard of these books. So he began to search those books. And he found them. And he said, he read it and said, no wonder why Pastor Kong quotes from this book so much. Wow, these are inspired word of God. He said. And in this book, he says, we should dwell upon the thought until it becomes our own and we know what saith the Lord. Ah, the word destroys the natural earthly nature and imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. Love takes the place of hatred and the heart receives the divine similitude. This is what it means to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If we receive the word of God, it kills our natural earthly things 
and imparts a new life in Jesus Christ within us. Now, this is eating the bread that comes down from heaven. Do you live by the word of God until it kills your earthly nature and help you to live in spirit? Then you can say, I live by the word of God. Mountains of blessings, thoughts from the mountain bless blessings, page 149. Whoever builds upon them is building upon Christ, the rock of age ages. In receiving the word, we receive Christ, and only those who thus receive his words are building upon him. We build on Christ by obeying his word. It is not he who merely enjoys righteousness that is righteous, but he who does righteousness. Holiness is not rapture. It is the result of surrendering all to God. According, we live according to the word of God. That's sanctification. That is holiness. Actually, the word of God makes us holy in our thoughts. Ah, religion consists in doing the words of God. We live Christian living, doing the words of God, make the words of God real in my behavior, in my life, in my plan. Education, page 126, the, the, the creative energy that called the words into existence is in the word of God. Creative energies. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. Oh my, the word of God, this one, this one, the word of God has a power of creation. It changes. It recreates, restores our soul back to the image of God. Now, if you do not experience it in your daily lives, something is wrong with my brothers and sisters. Something is wrong, isn't it? Something is wrong. No wonder why many churches are dead in the pews. Churches are dead. So they, don't, they don't understand about the living word of God, the fundamental educations. Page 341. To abide in faith is to put aside feeling and selfish desires, to walk humbly with the Lord, to appropriate His promises and apply them to all occasions. When you feel down and sorrow and sad and disappointed, don't look to it. That's our flesh. Our flesh will feel that all the time until Jesus Christ comes. There's no hope in our flesh. But look up to the Word of God and His, his promise. That's how we walk in the Spirit, friends. Okay. When a doubt attacks, John 20, 29 says, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. When you feel a doubt attacking you, think about the Word of God. Accept the Word of God like John 20, 29. When a discouragement attacks you, now read the verse like Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Take the Word of God and eat it. And choose the promise of God. When a grief attacks you, read the scripture like 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we, we ourselves are comforted of God. Read a scripture like this and it, it promises, and we feel better. We feel all okay. Our flesh will always feel temptations and then downwards. When a jealousy and a, and a hatred attack, read the Bible, Bible verse like Psalm 1430, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness, the rottenness of the bones. You see? 
to be cheerful. A jealousy and a hatred will destroy our spiritual life. Hmm, eat the word of God. When we are tempted, do not trust our feelings, but to believe the word of God. Number two, when we are discouraged, do not trust our feelings, but to believe the word of God. Number three, when we are persecuted, do not trust our physical feelings, but to believe the word of God. So live accordingly. Live by the word of God. We need to leave out the sanctuary message, which is the only blueprint of God for our salvation. Leave by the word of God, preceded from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, Testimonies, Volume 4, 346. God permitted your surroundings to exist, to develop character. Circumstances are controlled by the might of the will. In the name of Jesus, this is overcoming as Christ overcame. Jesus, when Jesus had lived in this world, he was surrounded by the disappointed circumstances. Temptations, attacks, hatred, persecutions, you name it, all kinds of evil circumstances. He was surrounded, and yet he lived by the word of God. You see? He controlled the circumstances, not the other way around. Ah, that's overcoming. Modern day Cornelius. Many, many good Christians from various denominations are calling God's servant. Come and teach us. God's 11th hour workers are being formed. Do you know that? God's final Harvests are coming out from many, many different churches. They're receiving the truth. They're receiving the truth of God, being prepared to become the part of the true remnant church. These are the people, maybe did not know much, but they knew what it, me what it, what it means to live by the word of God daily. Mm, modern day Cornelius. You know, time is up, so I have to, I have to uh, finish it. Okay, power of creation. When you see grape, what do you see? Power of creation. Peaches, coconuts, papayas, what do you see? S from the same soil, these, these things are coming up with a different flavor, different taste, different order, and everything. Do you like uh, durian? Do you know what durian is? Yes. Oh, probably you do. When I went to Malaysia some years ago, this brother told me that, well, Pastor Kang, you eat this. It smells so horrible. <laughs> smells so rotten, strong uh, onions, you know, like a, like, a, like a natural gas kind of odor. I didn't like it. What is this? Take it away from me. No, Brother Kang, if you don't eat this, you have nothing to do with us. So they forced me to eat, so I ate it, but I mean, it was sweet, creamy, very nice. Wow, but smells bad. So I ate, and I second time, I, I still didn't like it, but I ate, and the third, after the third time, I fell in love with it. Whoa, king of the food, beautiful. Even though it smells bad, it's just delicious. How in the world same soil produced that kind of different taste and di different, different uh, you know, uh, type of fruits? They look ugly, right? Certainly they look ugly outside, but they're, they're tasty. What do, we, what do we see? We see power of creation. If God can do that through the word of God, we can experience the power of creation, my friends. One down in the south of Korea, there was a, he passed away many years ago, Pastor Yang Won Son, Son, Pastor Son. One day, he was a Presbyterian pastor, and his two sons were killed by communists. And he said, I'm so thankful to the Lord that some people ha have only one martyr in their family, but I have two martyrs in my family. I thank the Lord. That's how you pray. Tremendous Christian. This pastor's son, 
One day was called to preach revival meetings in, in the revival meetings in certain church, and he was preaching the word of God. And all of a sudden, one one crippled crippled man stood up and healed. Just jumped up and he got healed and began to walk. And people were praising the Lord and saying, "Wow, Pastor Son healed the cripples. Pastor Son healed the cripples." Began to praise him and he said, "Stop." My brothers and sisters, stop. I have nothing to do with that healing. I came to preach. All I did is preaching the word of God. And then Lord healed that person. I don't take any credits of it. Amen. Powerful man of God. Word of God has power to heal the sick. He has a power through his word to heal your sin sick soul today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for thy grace and love. We trust thy word. Thy word has a power of creation. We do not have any strength to conjure any single righteousness. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot save from our sins. So, Father, have mercy upon us. We take thy word as it is. We eat it and contemplate and study. O oh Lord, exercise thy, exercise thy power of creation to save our soul utterly from the power of rebellion and sin. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.